place called Shooting Lee. Uh, the name, as you appreciate, is about shooting, and Lee, Lee is a clearing in a forest or a, in woodland, and shooting is telling you something about the activity that may have taken place there. So we are all too happily onto a hunting theme, and uh, what the research question was really was whether this was perhaps a hunting lodge in the forest of Ettrick, which is uh, covered a large part of the central borders from Selkirk to roughly to Peebles and south down to Hoyt. There's a vast area of country, uh, which from the 12th century was a hunt, royal hunting lodge created by King David. Right, so if, we can, if I can reach this, we'll get on. So, why shooting Lee? Well, I've explained the, the name. The location is just a couple of miles south of Traquair, which is on the top left of the screen up there. It's in a side valley of the Quairburn, which uh, runs into the Tweed near Inalethan, just north of Traquair. And the burn that the Shooting Lee is on is uh, called the New Hall Burn. This is a significant name. It suggests the presence of a hall in that area, but also of an old hall, presumably, because otherwise it wouldn't have a new one. And the question that is clearly in Joyce's mind is, where is that hall? And is that something to do with a hunting lodge? We have an early mapping of the site from the 18th century. It's shown on the map on the right, which is 1741. Uh, shooting Lee at that point is shown as, oh, maybe I should point it out. Uh, it's on the, it's on the right-hand side of the area that's shaded pink and shown as uh, the Traquair Estate. Uh, it's within the forest of Ettrick. It was on the east side of the burn, which is what you're seeing in the photograph on the bottom left. The burn there is the boundary between Selkirkshire and Peeblesshire and is inherited from the medieval divisions of the forest of Ettrick. So that's background and, one, and the research question that we had in mind. So what is the evidence that we can bring to bear on this? Documentary work was carried out to try and establish something of the history of the site. Shooting Lee actually first came to my attention in a completely different context as a farmstead that is depicted on the first edition map, which I haven't shown. The first edition map showed it as a site that was uh, abandoned, but uh, we know from the census return, that is uh, the details of which are up on the screen, in 1841 that there was a family there, elderly family with three children. The children left to go to Australia in the 1840s and the site was abandoned. But it had been a, a, a sheep farm before they left. So perhaps going to Australia was a very sensible decision. Uh, but I, in the Scotland's Rural Past project, we did a educational project with Yarrow and Electric Schools uh, one of the, the ancestors of the children there was, had lived at Shooting Lee, and this uh, was a connection which uh, she was chasing up, and we did a project with the school to go to the site and investigate it. So I was aware that there was an abandoned building there, which I took naively to be 19th century, possibly originating in the 18th century. I hadn't at that point done any further research, but this uh, evidence that we've uh, gathered, and mostly the work of Joyce, has been to show that there is evidence going back to the 15th century for this settlement, and that we know that uh, it was occupied by a branch of the Stuart family in the 16th century, who were the Lairds of Traquair at that time. We know there were three families there, or three hearths, and presumably three dwellings there at the end of the 17th century. So we have a number of different pointers to the kind of settlement it was. But the key one I want to draw attention to is the first one. In 1423, Sir William Middlemas was given the estate of, shoot, of uh, shooting Lee Ward uh, by the Earl of Wigton. And the document said that this consisted of two foresteads 
within Shooting Lee Ward. So apparently there was an award at that time. But it also states then, goes on to say, lying betwixt the master stead and the curra stead of the ward of Yarrow, and also the lesu called Glengaber. A lesu is a piece of pasture, just to, to help you understand that. So looking at the map, I'm looking at a map of the estate in 1719 of the Forest of Ettrick, we know that Tinnis was the seat of the Curra because we have the documentation that tells us this. And Tinnis is then, if you go west from Tinnis, there are two farms between it and Shooting Lee, but also between it and Cat Slack. But we know from the documentation Cat Slack and Shooting Lee are connected, or part of one unit in the, 15th, sorry, the 16th century. So the, I'm beginning to conclude from this that uh, we, have, we know where Tinnis is for the seat of the Curra, and there is a potential then that shooting, sorry, shooting Lee is where the master said might have stood. You could argue it could be a cat's lap too, of course. But we're going on that uh, on the basis of the evidence that we've put together so far. So, moving on. So what, what kind of thing do we expect to find at a place like Shooting Lee? Well, I did a survey of Old Tinnis in the 1980s and made this plan. The site is reduced to footings, so there's nothing standing above knee height. But what it shows is a track through a settlement leading up past some garden plots with on the right of that track there are some buildings labelled houses on this plan and on the other side a big enclosure with a group, a cluster of uh, footings of buildings quite close together which we take to be the seat of the, the current stead if you like with the, the main or elite establishment of the forest official that lived there. So this is the kind of thing that we thought we might expect to find at Shooting Lee. So the next thing to do is uh, do some survey work. We did initially, we, the survey work was uh, concentrated on the area of the pasture in front of the woods that occupies the slope above the the uh, terrace, and that reveals a series of small enclosures and small building stances, at least two anyway that we could identify. But we also got Edinburgh Archaeology Society to help out here, and I think there's some of the society in the audience today. Uh, they carried out a geophysical survey, which confirmed what we're picking out from, from the humps and bumps in the ground, and revealed that there are some other things that we hadn't picked out particularly at the top end of the uh, geophysical survey. And you can see the site of the 19th century house there, which was converted into a sheepfold in, in the later 19th century. So that was our first step in the interpretation of the site. The next step was to look at aerial photography, and we found that uh, within the trees that now cover the large part of the hill above the site, there are traces of enclosures. You can, if you look at the black and white 1971 image there, you'll be able to see enclosures beside the label that I've put on there. So this led us into the trees. Within the trees, we discovered a row of house platforms. Uh, four or five, depending on how you count them, of course on the same general alignment as the uh, 19th century building, which you can see in the photograph on the top left. Only one of the houses, though, in that group didn't have any trees on it. So you can see that's the one at the far end, labelled Trench 2, which we're going to be looking at. Uh, so that was a good target if we were going to examine one of the house sites. The first idea, though, was to see if we could get some dating, and that's the trench one, which is a strip across one of the enclosures outside the woods. I'm trying to avoid the woods is certainly an area of concern. So those are the two sort of key targets. 
but we didn't have anything that we could identify as being perhaps an elite structure or that might be a hunting lodge structure or building or group of buildings at this stage. Trench one was uh, just a one meter wide trench, as you can see. It revealed a, uh, a wall along the edge of a terrace which contained a garden soil which <coughs> full of fairly abraded pottery, bits of charcoal, clay pipe, bottle blast, a good range of post medieval artifacts, except for a couple of sherds of, yes, medieval pottery. Hooray, so we'd, we'd had at least got some evidence for medieval activity on the site. At the top end, we had evidence of a hard stand. The hard stand uh, was an, something we needed to investigate further. We didn't understand what its function was in relation to the garden plot. Lots of ideas about stack stands and things came to mind. But we decided to extend the site and uh, investigate that, see what, whether we had a building there. Uh, what we did find was then we had, a, we had a stand a couple of meters wide, just over two meters wide, with a wall along both sides. You might say, well, where's the wall on the right-hand side? Well, it's robbed out. There's a spray of debris from its robbing on the right. And we did find a few stones at the top end of that trench that showed that the, we did have a stone footing. But there was very little rubble or tumble from it. We, in amongst the excavation of the stones, we found uh, 18th century slipware. And we think that this is a, quite a late structure in the history of the settlement. Trench 2, which we started ooh, back in 2013, took a couple of years for us to excavate fully. This was, as you can see, a platform built on a platform cut into the scree slope which is the stonework on the right it had been heavily robbed especially at the end where the photograph has been taken from and you can see there's a hard stand of paving at the far end and you can see i hope the, the walls upstanding on the left hand side of the photograph where there's some pointy stones and you can see the revetment wall along the back so this is, our, this is the stage at which we began to start interpreting what we had. We think we have a bar house. Um, but we had one problem, which was how on earth we were going to um, plan all this stonework. So we decided that because one of our teams, Stephen Scott, had uh, not only access to a drone, he was a flyer of a drone, he had an EDM. We decided on a, a approach where we'd use the drone to take vertical photographs and use the EDM to fix points on the ground. We also use the EDM to three-dimensionally record all the individual artifacts. So this was then enabled us to produce a series of photographs of the site as we progress through the excavation. This is the latest phase. You can see the, the building, I think, laid out quite clearly there. It's um, three and a half metres wide internally by about 10 metres in length. It's got, so you can see the paved area at the, on the left-hand side of it. Uh, the entrance is roughly just where the ranging pole is at the bottom of the site. Uh, we've, unfortunately, the forest plough had taken out um, a slice through the middle of the site there, but we found one or two flat stones that uh, enable us to interpret that as the entrance. To the right of the entrance, there is a smaller paved area running into what we take to be the domestic end of the building. So it looks like a classic firehouse. Because of the degree of robbing on the, on the right-hand side of the building, which is the south end, we did wonder if that had been done. Was that to do with the robbing the house to make a stone for building a dry stone dike that runs along the edge of the forestry? or? Is it because at a later stage, perhaps in this last stage, it was used as a shed with, and the stonework was robbed <coughs> on the south end? Possible. So, having removed the top level of paving, we encountered the bar drain, very nicely constructed, uh, not running into any sump, but then 
you're on a scree slope here, it drains relatively easily. The central, you can see there's a right angle turn in the sort of lines of stones. I think we have a sort of central passage, uh, and then on the right hand side, the living area, with a hearth in the middle of it, which uh, we'll have a look at in a moment. You can see the construction of the walls quite clearly with the facing stones and earth and stone core. It's a fairly traditional um, method of construction. So this enabled us with the photography to construct a plan on a PC, which uh, we're then able to label with the different features and contexts. Uh, the hearth is identified there in pink and then shown you on the right. It's quite a large area of burning that we discovered uh, in, in the central of the southern end uh, with sheets of heat shattered stones and such like. So that's the limit of our real evidence for the different functions of the house except, except that we have the distribution of fines. We can see that they're mostly, I hope you can see that actually back there, the spots may be quite small. They are mostly situated, they're situated in the north end of the building uh, where the paving, the successive layers of paving are. And it may be that this is why we've got so many fines actually contained within it, because of that stratigraphy, whereas the south end has been cleaned out. There's a nice little cluster at the north end, which I've yet to examine the fine, particular fines in detail to discover why. However, that wasn't the end of the story. We excavated the, all the layers of flooring and we found one or two shares of medieval pottery underneath. We also found an area of burning running under the north wall. And you can see that we've excavated a section of the north wall to reveal uh, what was an area of spread of clay. You can see, the, I hope, on the left-hand side, the grey clay deposit that's about five centimetres thick with a fair number of lump, nice, thick, large pieces of charcoal in it, which we could use for dating. So, this we interpreted, it's about a metre across, a bit over a metre across this clay deposit, that we interpreted as a collapsed clay oven, presumably destroyed immediately before the construction of the building. The only medieval things we found on the site were these three sherds, they're fairly abraded, and uh, we th this was an indication of earlier activity on the site, but because of their broken and poor state, we don't think they're indicating any particular medieval occupation on this part of the site. We did find those medieval shirts of pottery, including slipwares like this. This one actually came up on the spoil tip. So, dating. From the finds, which were mostly post-medieval pottery, glass, uh, vessel glass, uh, clay pipe, these, the, we would have said yes, we had a building that has been occupied in the 17th and 18th centuries. The radiocarbon dates suggest to me that the clay oven was in use in the late medieval period, but the dates that we got from charcoal under the wall and from the fire drain suggest there's clearly not much interval between the disuse of the oven and the, the construction of the house, presumably in the early 17th century. So we're not, uh, we're not going to be finding medieval structures on this part of the site. So that, the next question is, where do we go next? At the south end of the row of houses was a platform which uh, was grown over with trees, but we decided that we could, by just uh, digging strips across it, um, try and see what kind of structure we had at this end. We had the argument being that the site perhaps has uh, developed along the road progressively from the lower end of the site. <coughs> a reason, reasonable possibility. So we put in a series of trenches here. Uh, the first one quickly reveals that we have a substantial stone structure. with four foot thick walls, still standing four courses high, as you can see on the left hand photograph. And inside, on the top right photograph, you can see there are at least two layers of paving that we discovered. Both of them have traces of burning on them. 
And so it seemed a bit fortuitous to find two successive paths on the same site, but that's apparently what we seem to have. <coughs> But because of the narrowness of the space, we haven't been able to do any more exploration of that. This is towards the end of last year. At the south end of the platform, we had covered a, a wall of similar construction, clay bonded, but with a rounded corner. And you've seen Windy Windshield with its round corner structure. You can get buildings, late medieval buildings, that have, will have round corners as opposed to square ones. So we shouldn't be too disheartened or surprised by that. What I wanted to say about this one was, apart from the fact we're using traditional means of planning here because of the limitations of the trees, was that we've got a cobbled floor that appears to run under this wall. And uh, to the left of that, to the left of the cobbled area, which runs under the wall, we have deposits that have the potential, I think, to produce <coughs> earlier phases of occupation. Second, the third trench that we excavated across the middle of the platform uh, produced some large stones suggesting a cross wall. And then to one side of it, the narrow um, stone lined drain, perhaps. We haven't excavated it yet, we're just suggesting it may be a drain. But initial cleaning of it produced a piece of hard fired medieval pottery, possibly a proto stoneware of uh, late medieval date. So we're encouraged here again that we have starting to find features that contain uh, pottery and medieval feet, uh, for medieval artefacts that may be in situ. But we also found a piece of dressed stonework. Top right hand side. Doesn't, there's nothing so far on the, from the building foundation we've discovered that would tell us it came from here or from there. It's more likely to come out of thought from a substantial mortared structure myself with dressed stonework for the coins. We also found uh, this knife, which um, I can't say anymore, that's clearly a good an example of a medieval style knife, but it was sealed under one of the paving stones at the south end of the building. But most of the finds so far from removal of the tumble have been 16th, sorry, 17th century, such as the clay pipe. But we got one shirt of uh, Low Country's greyware, from uh, underneath a wall line where the plough had pulled out some of the foundations and we were cleaning up underneath. So we think again, we have deposits here that are med medieval. One of the other things that we found that I wanted to draw attention to, we had we'd dug a sondage as a result of some uh, use of the metal detector just outside the line of the walls, to, or a couple of meters outside, and did a sondage on that spot and discovered the horseshoe, but also a two ounce lead weight. What is that doing on this site? And finally, before I move on and to sum up, we also found a cut mark rock, which was uh, found a couple of weeks ago. So, so what do we think we've got? Well, I think we've got um, what is otherwise called a peel house, examples of which are to be found south of Jedra in the forests of Jedra. Uh, near South Dean. Uh, the building that I made this plan of has got, it's about 10 by 7 in extent, and that compares very closely with the plan of uh, Mervinsaw Peel, which still stands. This is a site visit we made over the winter to the site, still stands to full gable height, bonded with clay, and one of a group of buildings as will be found in the area south of Jedburgh. So this is where we think we've got to at the present time. And I'll <coughs> sum up. Well, I think we've got, we've got enough evidence in the site, to, uh, pottery to date the site back to the 13th and 14th centuries. We haven't got any art fine, sorry, we haven't got any structures we can yet point to as being from the earlier medieval period, but we have now uh, 16th century structures like the ones south of Jedra, which is the standard dating for those kinds of peel houses. We have the bar house, post medieval bar house, and we have the outbuilding and garden plots, which are also producing that sort of range of dating. So that leaves us with trying to find, if you like, whether there is a master stead 
on the site and at the moment we are beginning to think that maybe we have got that site but we need to explore further to actually find the buildings that perhaps date back to the 15th century. So I'm going to finish off there but before I finish I should just like to thank Scottish Boards of Council for funding carbon dates and Scottish Woodlands Limited for giving us permission to carry out the work on the site. And also to all those volunteers who've given their labour entirely freely to get this project going and do all the hard work of shifting a huge amount of stone, including uh, some fairly back-breaking stone lifting. Thank you.